today as we come to the table. Now, there's nothing worse than a compromising Christian. And what do I mean by that? Because as a compromising Christian, if you've ever been there, you have one foot in the world, you have one foot in the church, and the sad thing is because of that, you can't be happy in either. You're one of the most miserable people on the face of the planet. Because when you're at church, you're just sitting there convicted the whole time. I can't believe he's talking about that. I can't believe today's the issue. I can't believe he's talking, oh, but you know you're wrong. And then you leave and you're miserable at church. Then you leave and you try to go out into the world and do what you've been doing that you know is wrong. And the whole time you're there, you're going, you know what? I know this is wrong and I shouldn't be doing this. And you're miserable in both places. We humans have a compromising nature, be it at work, where we frequently end up taking on work from our bosses despite having plenty of our own, or in a relationship, where we frequently sacrifice our spouse's happiness for our own. We even jeopardize our relationship with God by attending church on Sundays and then returning to our worldly ways the rest of the week. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. Pastor Mark explains today how we can stop compromising your relationship with God and begin living a godly life. When you attend church and begin to experience conviction, you begin to change your life choices in accordance with what God desires. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Genesis chapter 19 with today's edition of Come to the Table. Genesis chapter 19, excited about just getting in the Word today and very exciting and interesting portion of Scripture today. I originally planned on doing the entire chapter because chapter 19 flows together so well. I wanted to do the entire chapter, but I typically have eight or nine pages of notes and I ended up somewhere around between 18 and 20 and I decided we're going to make two weeks out of this unless you guys brought sleeping bags. So we're going to cover verses 1 through 14. And why don't we just read it together? Then we'll go back and look at it in better detail. Notice it says, Now the the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And when Lot saw them, he arose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Now, hear now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night, and wash your feet, and then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly so that they turned into him and entered his house. And then he made them a feast, and he baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now, before they could lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all of the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them through the doorway and he shut the door behind him. And he said, please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men since... This is the reason which they have come under the shadow of my roof. And they said, stand back. Then they said, this one came into sojourn and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands and they pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And then they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they were weary of trying to find the door. And then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in this city, take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. Father, I thank you for the power of your word. And Lord, what a powerful passage this is today. And Lord, what a warning for us. I pray as we look today, Lord, at the compromising Christian, Lord, that it would 
Be a warning to us not to go down this path. God, if we are not yet compromising, that we would be warned that compromise only ends in devastation. But God, if we are compromising, I pray you would use this passage to convict our hearts. God, let us hear what you say to our heart today. As we look at our lives, as we examine ourselves in light of Lot and what he was doing and where he was in his walk. And Lord, again, I thank you for this timing and I pray now that you would just pour out your spirit and that you would speak to your people through your word and teach us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the Bible says that God has given us his word as a, a warning. You know, his word is given to us not only informationally so that we might grow and that we might learn and obviously mature as Christians, but God has also written things that people that have gone before us have done so that we can learn from their mistakes and not make those same mistakes. Today is a classic example of that. And today we look at the consequences of compromise. Now you'll notice consequences of compromise, part one. I already told you that we're going to do it in two parts. And we're going to see the devastation that it brought in Lot's life by allowing compromise in his life. You know, you can't control what people around you do. And you can't control how the world around you goes. But what you can do is make sure that you don't become a part of it. And you can make sure that you don't begin to let down your guard and actually begin to blend in and actually have a situation where not only does it not bother you anymore, but you actually are a party to it. And that's exactly where we're going to see Lot today. Maybe not to the extreme that they went, but Lot was still involved in this situation as we're going to see even as being involved in leadership in the city. Now, there's nothing worse than a compromising Christian. And what do I mean by that? Because as a compromising Christian, if you've ever been there, you have one foot in the world and you have one foot in the church. And the sad thing is because of that, you can't be happy in either. You're one of the most miserable people on the face of the planet. Because when you're at church, you're just sitting there convicted the whole time. I can't believe he's talking about that. I can't believe today's the issue. I can't believe, he's, oh, but you know you're wrong. And then you leave and you're miserable at church. Then you leave and you try to go out into the world and do what you've been doing that you know is wrong. And the whole time you're there, you're going, you know what? I know this is wrong and I shouldn't be doing this. And you're miserable in both places. You know, Jesus said, I wish you were hot or cold. He said, because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. It's like, you know, at least if you're cold in the world, you at least know where you stand. And now it's a matter of just coming to repentance and being broken and getting right with God. If you're hot and you're on fire for the Lord, then of course you're already separating yourself from the world, but you know where you stand. The bad thing about the compromiser is they never know where they stand. They're somewhere right in the middle. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. And so the mixing of it makes their life miserable and it makes their testimony miserable as well. And today we're going to see a man just like that in the man Lot. He was what I would call a compromising Christian. And note this, the compromising Christian is sure to have a life of loss and disappointment. They will have loss of relationship with the Lord. They will have loss of testimony among the world. They will have loss of family immorality. And oftentimes they give everything up and compromise simply for the temporary pleasures of this world. How sad. I think sometimes we forget that this world is passing away. You know, when you realize it's all going to burn, it's not so important, is it? And so... We get our minds sometimes on the things down here. We can only see what is right here in front of our face. We forget about eternity and we find ourselves compromising because we want to get along and we want people to like us. Listen, if you are going to live for Jesus Christ, you are going to have people that don't like you. You need to settle that in your heart and deal with it and say, all right, it's not that you're trying to go out and get people to dislike you. It's not that you're trying to be rude or obnoxious. That's not the point. We should be the most loving people in all the world, showing the love of Christ. But the bottom line is we are in a spiritual battle. Satan hates God and Satan hates you. And if you make a stand for God, he's going to stir in people's heart and the world around you to dislike you as well. And I think the hardest place for a person to be is somebody who wants everybody to like them and be a Christian. That is a hard place to be. And I tell you, I come from that background. I, you guys know that. I used to be a, you know, a musician, an entertainer. If people don't like you, you don't make any money. And you don't get any jobs. And so you have to try to learn to make people like you. Listen, when it comes to Jesus Christ and the things of God, that can't be a factor. You've got to stand for what's right and live for what's right in everything you do and realize some people are just not going to take it right. That's the bottom line. But if we find ourselves in a place of compromise where we're trying to get along with everyone in the sense of lowering our standards, and note that I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to get along. I'm saying we don't lower our standards to get along. And if we have to lower our standards to get along, that's our warning that we're compromising. Note that. How can I know I'm compromising, Pastor Mark? It's when you have to lower your standard in order to get along. That is called compromise. And there's times when, again, if you don't lower your standard, you're not going to get along. Well, all right, you're not going to get along. 
And that's just kind of how it is being a believer. Jesus did not get along with everyone, and Jesus didn't lower his standard. But here's what Jesus did, and here's what we've got to make sure we do. Love everyone. And the greatest form of love we can have is teach them the truth and speak the truth, whether it be to our family and friends or to our society. Speaking the truth in love, as the Bible says, and non-compromising. That's what it's all about. Now, again, we talked about the loss in life that you'll have. We look at Lot today, and we're going to see over these next two weeks all the losses that compromise brought into Lot's life. I mean, he lost his family. He lost his, his reputation. He lost, most importantly, his reputation or rather his relationship with the Lord. He lost so much. And was it really worth it? Everything that he was losing all of these valuable things for ended up burning in flames down in Sodom and Gomorrah. And we have to ask ourselves, what are we sacrificing for the sake of this world so that we can get along? What are we doing so that we won't be uh, one who stands out in a crowd? Listen, I believe as Christians, we should stand out in a crowd, and that is so the crowd can hear the right way to the Father. Jesus Christ stood in the crowds, and he cried out and said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He wasn't shy. When they were questioning him in his trial, he said, I didn't do anything that I did in the corner. He said, I was out in the open. You heard everything that I said. Ask the people, they'll tell you. And that's really how we need to be as believers, to know where we stand and to know why we stand there. And I know that's getting more and more unpopular today. We live in a compromising society. Why can't we all just get along? We hear the word tolerant thrown around on a regular basis, don't we? Let's be tolerant. Listen, I believe in love on the things that are non-sinful. We should be very tolerant. God is a gracious God and he's long-suffering, but we should never be tolerant of sin. The believer cannot tolerate sin. We have to call it what it is. We have to expose it. As a matter of fact, the Bible says not only to not be a part of sin, the Bible says expose the deeds of darkness. And rather than Lot exposing the deeds of darkness, Lot had become so compromised that now it's about to eat his lunch. He's swallowed in by what he's gotten involved in, and we're going to see that if it wasn't for the Lord and angels there to rescue him, Lot would have probably been a dead man. Not only raped by this mad mob, but he probably would have been killed in the midst of it. And so, again, we see God's mercy and God's grace in Lot, and we need to take warning that we don't head down that same path. Now, it's interesting. The Scriptures declare in 2 Peter that Lot was saved. It says that Lot was a righteous man, that he knew the Lord. He was what we would call today a Christian. And I have to tell you this, if it wasn't for the Lord telling us that Lot was a Christian, I wouldn't have guessed that he was. And for the compromising Christian, and for the Christian who's living in carnality, only the Lord knows who's really saved and who's not, but there should be some level of fruit. Now, we do see at least in this situation that Lot has some level of fruit, and that is he stands up to them and says, men, this is wrong. Don't do this. So there is some fruit in his life that truly he does know the Lord, but the fruit was so negligible, had you not been the Lord, you probably wouldn't have known that he was saved. And yet, the Bible tells us that indeed he was saved, and this is where the carnal Christian finds themselves, and this is where the compromising Christian finds themselves. You know, it's always a warning sign when someone says, hey, do you believe that coach or that player is a Christian? And if it's somebody that's well-known and you don't know, chances are they're either greatly compromising or they're not. Because a true Christian who's living for the Lord is going to be vocal about it. And you can tell the difference between those who truly know the Lord and those who don't know the Lord by what they share. If you have to wonder, do they know the Lord? Well, it may be an underground a carnal Christian or an underground compromising Christian, or it may be somebody that doesn't even know the Lord. But the bottom line, compromise in the Christian life is devastating. And so we're going to see that, you know, with Lot, it gets him in big trouble. Notice here in verse 1. Now remember the setting. He had, the angels and the Lord had already come to see Abraham, give him his message about the new baby that they were going to have. And now they're going down to Sodom and Gomorrah to, again, deal with Sodom and Gomorrah. And notice what happens in verse 1. It says, now the two angels came to Sodom, in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Now, it doesn't tell us what it was, again, that let Lot know that these visitors were special, but very obviously Lot could tell. It may have simply been the spiritual eyes that he had. You know, as a believer, you can see things in the spirit that the world can't see. And when the men came up, Abraham knew right away as he bowed himself down that this was the Lord and, and some angels with him. And now we see Lot coming and bowing down, which is a customary thing to do, but acknowledging these men as somewhat of honor and again, bowing down before them and lowering his head. And again, we don't know how it was he could tell, but he could tell something was different. Maybe he saw it again because indeed he, he did know the Lord. But notice this is interesting to me. When we see the compromise in Lot's life, it's not a good start from what the angels find. Notice this, when the angels get there, the very first thing they find in Lot's life, in this compromising Christian life, is that he is sitting in the gate of the city. Now, we need a little history background to understand why that's a compromise. Understand this, in ancient times, the gate of the city is what we would call today city council. This is where the mayor, 
This is where the leaders, the governor, you know, again, in that situation, on a smaller level, the city officials, the council, they sat in the gate. And if you had official business, you would go to the gate and interact with these leaders there in the gate. Remember Jesus said, if your brother has something against you, you know, go to your brother. But then he gives another example of if your brother has something against you that is a legal issue, take, you know, go with your brother, get it right before he drags you to the court. Well, this is where they would bring you. If you'd go in a city, you would grab somebody and say, you owe me some money or we have to get this right. You bring them to the gate of the city. And I've seen one of these gates, uh, an ancient gate of a city. It's, the way it's set up is they have these seats that go down the sides of the walls, and you would go in, and the officials would sit in these seats down the sides of the wall, and that would be there. They would do their work right there throughout the day. And as any issues came before them, they would deal with those issues. Now, why is that interesting here in showing the compromise that had entered into Lot's life? Because Lot had not only compromised to the point to where he was living among the Sodomites, Lot was now actually in leadership because he's sitting in the gate of the city. Now, remember where this started. See, here's a warning to us. It first started with Lot simply gazing down the plain. He simply looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah, didn't he? And then the Bible says he pitched his tent towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Got a little bit closer, just where you could see it. Then the next time we see Lot, he's in Sodom and Gomorrah. And now we see Lot, and Lot is actually leadership in Sodom and Gomorrah. This is a picture of a compromising Christian. And really, it's a picture, you might even say, almost of a compromising politician in a way, because now he's in government here in the, in the city leadership. And again, he's had to compromise his stands in order to be elected, if you will. What a sad situation to be in. And so Lot here again, now being involved, putting up with this sin, you know, it's one thing to put up with it. It's entirely another thing to be an active part of it and to be right in the midst of it. But again, note the stark contrast now between Abraham and Lot. And as we go through this, you'll see the differences in Abraham and Lot in the difference of a committed Christian and a compromising Christian. Notice with the committed Christian, the Lord and two angels came and they had fellowship. Notice with the compromising Christian, who's strangely missing? The Lord. Only the two angels show up. Why? Because when you live a life of compromise, your relationship with the Lord will be compromised and God will now be distant from you. The Bible says in Isaiah 59 too, he says, you know what? It's your sin that has separated you from God. It's not a loss of salvation we're discussing here. As very clearly in 2 Peter, it says that Lot knew the Lord and we see the angels yank him out of there. But what it is, is a loss of relationship, a loss of intimacy, a loss of closeness. And let me say this as a warning to us. If we live a compromising Christian life, we are never going to have the relationship of the committed Christian with Jesus Christ. Yes, you will be his child. Yes, you can get in the kingdom of God, but you will never have that intimate relationship that God desires. You see, the Bible says that light and darkness can't cohabitate. And the Bible warns us, do not grieve the Spirit of God. And when we live a compromised Christian life, we're grieving the Spirit of God, and it hurts our relationship. And now the Lord can't come close to us. He can't have the intimacy that He wants to have, uh, that He has with the committed Christian. The compromiser will always be connected to darkness. And since the Lord is light, it will always squelch his spirit. And Lot now here in this situation, you know, is doing that. He's compromising and squelching the spirit of God. And so notice he says in verse two, and he says, here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet that they, you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, no, we'll, we'll spend the night here in the open square. And I understand this was not an unusual thing to say. Back in that day, there were very few hotels. Not all cities even had them. And oftentimes, if they did have a hotel, it was very dirty and very dangerous. It was not a place you wanted to stay. So it was customary that you would take people in. As people came to visit, you would invite them to come in. But again, also, many times, people would simply sleep out in the streets. They would have, in the warmer parts of the year, they had these outer robes that covered them that they used as their blanket. And so they would simply find a comfortable place. They could lean against a wall or something, and they would get some sleep that night and move on the next morning. Now, not exactly the best bed and breakfast, so to speak, but that was their only option. They couldn't do much more than that. So they say, you know what, Lot, that's all right. We'll just stay right in here. We're fine. And Lot, notice he says here, no, no, no. Verse three, he insisted strongly. And so they turned into him and entered his house, and then he made them a great feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now, notice here, it says he strongly insisted. Now, I know that it was customary to bring people in, but this strong insistence here comes with a, a meaning of exceedingly urging them. He wasn't going to let this go, is the picture. No, you will be staying at my house tonight. This is not an option. That would be the best way to describe the urgency of that word there. And why was there such urgency? Because Lot knew what his city was like. I knew what they were like. He knew if they stayed out there, then you know what? There's going to be big trouble. As a matter of fact, remember the Lord said, I'm going to go down and see if the outcry against Sodom is as bad as he said, so to speak. And of course, we know the Lord knew, but he wanted firsthand, you know, to go down and see it. 
But the bottom line is, why did the, what was this outcry? It may, well, it may very well have been not only the sin of the city, but maybe those that have already passed through before these two angels got there. Maybe some who did sleep out in the city center and were raped. And so now we see this whole situation setting up where Lot's like, you know what? You know, whether he knew completely these guys were angels or not, I don't know. But he certainly realized that these guys needed to be protected. Something in his spirit made him realize he needed to bring these guys in. And so he says, no, you can't do this. You've got to stay with me uh, because this is not going to be a good situation. And notice verse 4 here. They have this big feast together there in verse 3, and they have this time uh, uh, together. It's interesting here. You don't see, it doesn't say much about Lot's wife. We'll see her in the second half. But I don't know how involved she was in this situation, as even here, Lot's the one apparently making the feast for them. And typically in that day, it was the woman who would prepare the food and do all that. Uh, We're going to see that her heart was in the wrong place. We'll get to that next week. But notice verse 4, it says, Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, and all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. Now note this, this wasn't just one small bad group. Notice it says, everybody. Everybody. From every corner of the city. It wasn't like a certain area. You're in a bad neighborhood. No, they were all bad neighborhoods. There wasn't a good neighborhood in Sodom. And now they surround the house and they're going to ask for this wicked deed. Now you can see why God had to judge the entire city. But notice this. It gets even worse. Notice it says both old and young from every quarter. That word young means boys and or children. In other words, non-men. What is my point? Guys, this society had come become so corrupt that even the children were waiting outside with their parents and their peers to rape these men. Now you might say, how in the world could a society get so bad? I say to you today that I believe we're headed that same direction. Guys, look at our children today. Now why did the children, note this parents, why did the children end up that way? It was the example their parents lived. I'm not saying that we in here are that example to our kids. or that we're, I'm saying as a society... The parents of the society, the leaders of the society, the way they lived is how the kids became. And if our standards are low, what can we expect from our children in the next generation? You see, we as believers have to have a high standard based on the Word of God. I look at the generation before my generation. What a different standard they had, even just in their work ethic. Let me just for a moment. The work ethic of the generation before us, if you called them and asked them to do a job, are you ready? They really did it. (laughs) Really. They really would. They would really show up. It's amazing. I've never seen a work ethic like that. They actually worked. And you know what else? They actually showed up on time. Our generation has a very low work ethic. Why is that? Because, again, we were not trained up. We grew up in a society with video games and leisure and play. And all we do is know how to play. And when it comes time to work, we don't know how to do it. Now, take that example and transfer that over to the spiritual realm for a moment here in light of this situation. Guys, listen, if we are not the leaders and holding up a high standard for our children in what the standards need to be in our home and in the life that they live, what is the next generation going to be like? Listen, do you realize that we as the leaders of this society, let's look at our kids today. Listen, we have girls fighting fist fights and ending up on the news. Listen, and this is not like an unusual thing. We have children, 8, 9, and 10 years old, engaging in sexual activity. We have teachers that are engaging with our children on a regular basis. What is happening to our society? Now, here's what's scary. Those are the leaders of tomorrow. Isn't it interesting that it only took a couple of chapters in after God created everything for mankind to find a way to rebel? This is human nature, isn't it? Throughout history, God has something great in mind, but people find loopholes and do things their own way, rebelling against God. Something that's striking in the book of Genesis is that God remains faithful even when mankind does not. God keeps his promises when it would be impossible for anyone else to do so. What an amazing God we serve. Pastor Mark has been working his way through the opening book of the Bible, and there's so much more to gain from it. Come to the Table is a radio ministry of Calvary Knoxville. If you're enjoying these teachings, head over to The Way Media. Net. To hear more, just click on the Come to the Table tab while you're there. If you have any questions or comments about today's message, we'd love to hear them. Just look for the questions and comments link. If you're ever in the Knoxville, Tennessee area, we'd love for you to drop in and see us. You can find service times and locations on thewaymedia.net. Scroll to the bottom of the page and find a link to Calvary Knoxville. We have several service times that could accommodate whatever type of schedule you have. 
We're so thankful that you've joined us today, listening to Pastor Mark's thoughts and insights on the book of Genesis. There's more to learn and appreciate from the beginning of the Bible on. So come next time, grab your Bible, maybe a cup of coffee, and be ready to understand the great things God has for you to learn the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.